Welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. I'm Linda Topping Streitfeld, the Director of Programs here at NPF, and this is a webinar for journalists on taking better pictures with your cell phone. I'm joined today by Torin Beasley. He's a Vice President of Seabury Design and Communications and a former managing editor at Newhouse News Service. There, he created social media strategies and coordinated web, editorial, and graphics operations. For those who don't know us, the National Press Foundation is a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. Our mission is to improve the work of journalists in the U.S. and around the world. All of our programs are on the record, and we always encourage questions. Today, because this is a recorded webinar, we can't take live questions, but you can tweet them to us at Nat Press. We'll use the magic of the Internet to make answers happen for you. A quick commercial message. All National Press Foundation programs are free for journalists, whether they're webinars such as this, in-person programs, a half day or four days, they're all free. To keep that up, we depend on sponsors, program funders, and viewers like you. So if you find today's program helpful, please surf over to our website at nationalpress.org. Use the Donate button on the home page, and you can be part of our work to improve the quality of journalism. On that note, Torin, I'm turning to you. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk about using the iPhone to take pictures. And it doesn't have to be an iPhone. It can be whatever mobile device you have. I can tell you I love my iPhone. But I have more than 700 pictures on here. And maybe only a handful are even worth putting on Facebook. So why is it so hard to take good pictures on a mobile device? Well, there, there are a lot of problems with mobile devices. And I have I have 2,300 pictures on my iPhone. I love it too, and probably 20 videos. So there's a lot of trial and error, and people, you know, get involved with taking pictures. But I think what's most important for them to understand is what the principles of photography are, and why it's important to pay attention to them when you're using your iPhone or any camera for that matter um, to take pictures. So my first, the first strategy I have for anybody who wants to take really good pictures on their iPhone is to walk into the light. I know we hear that a lot, mostly from horror movies, but the, the idea is that we need to recognize that photographs, good photographs, and if are really based on light. And so if you're paying attention to the light and what the light does, especially in the area of the frame that, that you're focusing on, then you can put together some pretty good images because that's, that's the first and most important rule is that you need to pay attention to the light. So it's all about the exposure. It is. It, a lot of it is about the exposure. And there are other problems, you know, the problems of camera shake that we want to overcome. But there's composition. That's another, another rule that we'll talk about. There's, there's the idea that every time you are taking a picture, you're actually telling people a story. And that's important to pay attention to. But it all starts with light. So how do you fix the exposure? How do you make sure you have the right one? Well, I'll tell you, if we can look at, my, at the first slide, we'll, we'll describe what, because um, we have some slides here, and we'll describe exactly what's going on in them, and that will, um, that will help us. Uh, so the first slide, what we're seeing is what would appear to anybody to just be a rock wall, but, but let's look at some of the qualities on this wall. Let's see how the rust has come out. And the reason why that's come out and the texture on the wall has come out is because this particular photographer, Bio Lucatan, was paying attention to the light. And you can see what light does to the wall and what it does for the texture on the wall, what it does for the colors on the wall. It also helps to create patterns with shadow. So you have the, 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 the pattern of the three lights there, but then just below that, you see the lights repeating themselves in shadow. Exactly. All of those things make that particular image very, very interesting. Um, if we go to the next image, because there are a lot of examples that we, I think we want to use, even when there doesn't seem to be light, there's light. So on cloudy days, on gray days, you can still find the light and expose for that area of the image. There's, and, now in this picture, the fact that the chairs are almost silhouettes, it gives it a kind of spooky aspect. Sure. Sure, but there are three areas in this picture that you could expose for. When you look behind the clouds and you see the brightest area of the, uh, of the picture, you could expose for that, and that will change dramatically what everything else looks like. If you pick the gray area, the middle area, which is like the base of the clouds, you could expose for that. That's going to change what the image looks like. 
If you look at the sand, you can expose for that. That's going to change what the image looks like. So when we talk about exposure, you want to also choose which area of the, of the image, of your frame, of what's before you that you want to expose for. And in iPhones, you can do that by simply tapping those areas. So when you so, tap the area, it changes the exposure, and you can see what that image is going to look like. And when it matches your mood, you take the picture. So I'm looking at my iPhone. Mm -hmm. I have a square, and I see an image mm -hmm. in the square. Mm -hmm. And you're saying if I simply touch the actual phone at a certain place on the image, the light, the exposure will change, and I'll be able to see that. Exactly. And You'll then when I'm happy, there you I go. touch the button. You take the picture. But touching the button, that kind of brings us to another a thing that, that, that is a problem, uh -huh. and that's camera shake. Because when you, right. look at, when you look at your iPhone and you, when you hold it up to take pictures, I see a lot of people trying to hold the phone with one hand and then touch that little white button with the other. Right. And when you hit that button, you introduce vibration. Yes. Or if you're holding it in one hand and that hand is shaking, you have issues with the shake. Right. A lot of folks don't realize if you hold the phone with both hands with the two little buttons at the top, that those buttons will trigger the shutter. Oh, so you don't actually have to touch in the, you can, no. Oh. Those two buttons at the top, they will trigger the shutter, either one of them. If I take a picture holding it like this, using the buttons on top, will my image be right side up? Yeah, sure. Your image will be right side up, but what the, what, what the issue is going to be is you're going to reduce the amount of camera shape right. because now you've got a cradle for the phone. The same thing can be true if you want to hold the phone vertically. Because remember, your fingers are not going to get in the way in the front of the phone, the viewfinder where you're looking. Your fingers are going to get in the way if you put them in front of the lens. So if you have them on the side and you want to, again, secure your phone, you can do that by creating a cradle for your phone and using those buttons on the side. And that will reduce shake, both horizontally and vertically. Can I interject a, a quick question that we haven't talked about? But I've heard people say you should never even take a vertical picture. They, it should always be horizontal because that's what sh works best on screens. Can you speak to that? Well, if they're talking about a movie screen, a television screen, that's true. It, when you're taking a video, there's no vertical videos. I, I can't tell you how many times <laughs> there are huge jokes, um, even in my family. Um, there are vertical video takers, and they uh -huh. keep getting emails back from other members of my family who are videographers saying, nobody does vertical videos. But, but okay. that's not the case with images, though. Got it. With photos. Got photos it. that are intended for publication either in magazines, in newspapers, or, or, or even on the web, you can use horizontal and vertical formats. Great. Vertical formats don't look good in slideshows on the web. So I do need mm. to, I do need to say that right. because you get these large black areas on the side right. of the slideshow and nobody's going to put up a vertical slideshow right. but you know for for print editions and for web editions of newspapers where you're just dealing with the image horizontal and vertical is a good idea great certain pictures like this is one actually really seem to just invite you to look at them to linger for a while to examine them <clears throat> how do you have to be an artist to compose a picture like that, or are there specific rules that can actually help people like me? Well, I think the, the first thing is that you pay attention to what's in the entire frame. And you also pay attention to the reason why you're even taking that picture. Mm. So if you're looking at that picture, in this particular picture that we were looking at, if you're looking at that picture and you're saying to yourself, wow, this is a peaceful scene, now you know why you're taking that picture. And so you pay attention to the elements in the image that inspired you to feel that way. And that's how you get to composing the image in a way that makes sense for the viewer to experience what you experienced. And that's why you pay attention to your exposure. That's why you choose where you're going to expose the, your, your image so that what happens is people end up getting the same feeling you get. Right. So when you get to that place, tapping the screen, where you say, ah, that's it. Right, that's take the picture. The exactly. But what about composition? There, there must be rules about lines, and you mentioned mm -hmm. the graphic element of a previous mm -hmm. picture we looked at. Well, there are a couple more. If we, if we go to the, to the next slide, 
Um, we can talk about composition, and, but there are other images too. This slide, when you, when you look at composition, and once again, we're talking about going into the light. We choose where the exposure is. But you also can talk about elements in the image that move people to what you want them to see. And in this particular case, you've got this area on the left-hand side in, in black that is actually working like an arrow to push people to the horizon, where the light is that draws people across the horizon. It's beautiful. And if you go to the next image, and I think the next image is the same thing, now we're using a different element. We've got this bridge on the right-hand side that's pushing people back to the horizon. And we've got the trail of light that's coming from there that we can follow back to the horizon. So when you talk about competition, composition, you're also going to be talking about elements in the image that help move the viewer to see what you want them to see. And I think if we go into the next image, <laughs> composition. This, this is my favorite. <laughs> OK. There, there, there's also an element of composition that uses space. And we call it positive and negative space. Uh -huh. For, By way of a simple definition, the positive space is the stuff that jumps out at you. The negative space is the stuff that moves back, often giving depth to the image. So in this particular case, you've got this, this large belly area that's positive space, and you've got the hands that are positive space, but the hands are also serving as elements like arrows that keep you focused on the belly. And because of the exposure, which we talked about a little earlier, you've got the dark areas that give the image depth that move back, but in effect, in visual effect, those dark areas are pulling the belly and the hands forward. Wow, there's so much more in that picture. I, I just thought it was an alligator. <laughs> but you have to understand why people respond to it, though, because yeah. if the exposure is not right and the belly is blown out, or if the exposure is not right and the image is flat, then you don't get the same right. response. And we've got some others. If we go to the next image beyond this, here's where texture comes in into play. Um, and, and while positive and negative space still are there, because the, in, in this case it's almost reversed because you have this really bright area of, of orange, but the black now stands out because of that area. Right. You know, you, you're able to focus on what the shadows are doing. But look also at the repetitive pattern that moves from left to right. You have the door on the left that serves as the initial block, but then you have these, these lines, this pattern of lines that are moving across the frame. And if you notice, just slightly because of parallax, they're tilted a little bit to the right, which helps move your eye to the right. So you get the action that the photographer, Tyrone Turner in this case, um, wanted you to, to, right. to have. The, you get to focus where he wants you your, to focus. Your eye almost slides right off the, the right side, right through the picture. Exactly. And Beautiful. even on the left-hand side, at the bottom, there's a little help. The left-hand side is very dark, pushing you back. But then look at the shape that comes just below the doorknob mm -hmm. that's actually moving in the direction of pushing you back towards the shadows again. So these things are very, very important. And you actually do see them. You know, the eye picks up trillions of bits of information per second and feeds them to your brain. The biggest thing for, for most of us that are taking pictures is that we're not processing, that we're getting all of that information. Right. So it's really, it's, really, uh, it's really interesting that when we start processing that, then we start to see where the picture really is for ourselves. And um, even if, just another example, if we go back to uh, how line and texture, if we go to the next slide, when you look at this, this is a series of lines. But because of the use of, of color, you can see how the yellow areas stand out and start to move forward and how all of the other, so you can find pattern, you can find line, you can find shape, and all these things make it, make it very, very interesting. What is that a picture of? Scaffolding. Where was it taken? Um, you know, yeah. I'm not sure where this was taken. It was on the West Coast, though. Really beautiful. Yeah. Just so imaginative. Mm -hmm. But it's just noticing that. And people notice that all the time, and they go, ooh. And if we start really paying attention to what we put in our frame, then that ooh becomes a picture that we can share. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, is there one more in this group? Uh, I believe so. I think there is another one. Oh, another picture that sure. is, is gorgeous, and I have no idea what it is. <laughs> what, what are we looking at? OK, well, what we're looking at here is anybody who's taken the train, this is the little rumble strip at the edge of the platform. Oh my gosh. I would not have guessed. 
And the thing about it is, noticing the pattern, seeing the way the light strikes it, getting down on the ground, angle, is very, very important. And there's a, a very faded do not cross line or stay in front of the line that's off to the right, but that's not, that's, that's not what gives it the impact. What gives it the impact is that you've got all of these yellow dots moving in one direction, carrying you off toward the horizon, but then they're complemented by the, har the, um, I'm sorry, the diagonal shadows that show up in between because of the, the way the sun is. So it makes the pattern in both ways. It takes a pattern two ways. It makes it very, very interesting and a very, very powerful image. And then the color, obviously, the yellows and the blacks, they just make it, they just yeah. make it stand out. Yeah, it's, fantastic. It's amazing. So often, the stories that we tell as journalists are very complicated, they're very nuanced, but sometimes the right image really does convey more than words. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I th what I think everybody should be aware of is that there really isn't that much, if any, creative difference between writing and taking a picture. The, the point of, of it is communication. The point of it is telling a story the point of it is creating an image in the viewer or the reader's mind. That's the point. So when you're a journalist, if you start to dissolve the wall of separation between the craft that you, that you practice writing and the one that you'll practice visually, you'll start to see that the same signals apply. That you have a story idea, that story idea elicits an emotion from the writer. You get connected to your stories, there's no doubt about it and you create a perspective from which you would like the reader to understand the story. And that perspective is very much your own. So is the image. So when you go to tell that story in images, you're inspired by the same um, emotions, the same need to express, to tell a story that you are when you're writing the story. So you bring that to the visual process and your images get better. Great. You know, there's a lot about being self-aware that just carries into the process. Right. Let's look at some examples. Sure. Um, let's go to the next step. <coughs> so here, what I want to talk about here is that the, the things that inspire you here is that the rule of thirds. When you divide an image into three sections and you create image, uh, interest in each area, you start to tell a story. You start to give people a sense of what you felt when you saw it. In this particular image, for example, you've got the tree in the upper third, which I think is a good idea to block some of that sunlight because right. that, that sun is extremely powerful. Right. Without it, people would be so focused there without the tree that, that the rest of the image would start to fall apart. But you also have in the foreground the shadows and the dark, rich texture that move you to the center where the subject is. And the subject is actually in the middle third. Now, generally, right. We would say, you never want anything sitting dead center in an image because it creates a static image. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it works because the image is really divided in thirds from top to bottom. And there's interest that brings you, the, the, like if you look at the shadows on the right and the shadow on the left, they almost create an arrow that take you directly to the subject and the experience that Absolutely. the subject has. Right, and so, there's nothing static about that picture. Exactly. There's so much happening in every part of it. There even and I didn't notice this earlier, two people standing off to the, to the right. Mm -hmm. That help move you, and, the, and, the, and the, it's, it's really interesting. A lot of times you see these things after the fact, but in truth, photographers see them. They actually mm -hmm. see them because a lot about photography is instinct. Mm -hmm. And it's trusting that your eyes are bringing you the information that you can pay attention to because your eyes are incredible. I mean, they do so much math. I remember, uh, just sort of an aside, a study about baseball players and how their eyes can not only detect the speed of the ball, but the movement of the ball across the plane and anticipate when that ball is going to drop into the bat, the plane of the bat, so that they can hit it out of the park. Same thing happens with photography. It happens with everything because we're wired for that kind of visual input. When you walk out of your house in the morning, the first thing you want to know is, is it safe? And you don't realize how much you're looking around to determine that it's safe to take that next step. You've taken in that whole scene. Same thing is happening with your, with your camera. That's great. We have <coughs> more images, I think, mm -hmm. to sure, talk about do. storytelling. This so, is a great one. <laughs> Number one, 
it surprises people that you can take sports images with an iPhone and you can. It depends on where you are. Uh -huh. And in addition, there are all kinds of accessories that you can buy. Um, I think I mentioned to you earlier that there's a little website called photojojo.com, just one of many. And you can go there and you can pick up lenses. You can get tripods to help you reduce uh, camera shake. Mm -hmm. You can get all kinds of different accessories that, that will help you in, in taking pictures and telling stories. Mm -hmm. And in that particular image, if you're right in front of the action, remember that action coming toward you appears slower than action moving across a frame. So when people get to a sporting event and they say, if a, uh, a reporter gets to a sporting event and the reporter says, well, what can I do to make sure that I get a good photo, all I have is my iPhone. I really hate my boss because all they gave me is an iPhone <laughs> and what I need is you know, a big DSLR. And what happens is, think about your position. Get close to the track, get yourself a little bit in front or just off to an angle, and that action will be completely stoppable. You can also follow, which is a little more difficult, but that action would be completely stoppable. And if we go back to that image, you'll see what happens here is you've got it in a, in a great spot. The front wheel is just a little bit off, off the ground, but you also have texture coming from the back of the bike going toward the, the uh, right edge of the picture that gives you that sense that motion is happening. Right. The, you know. the rider and the bike are completely clear, but you really see the motion. Exactly. You really see it. Um, so, you know, those are, and we have another picture. What's, what's the, uh, let's go to the next slide, too. Again, what we're talking about here is a play of light and how we handle motion. Here you have someone in a restaurant, but you're giving people a sense of how busy the place is because there are folks walking by, the motion is there, the person in the foreground is stopped, the light is beautiful, the exposure is there, and you can also tell the rest of the story of what that place is like if you look beyond the subject's shoulder, you see light hitting another person. Right. So every important area of this photo is lit in a way that you can tell the story of this restaurant and even get a sense of how that person is feeling as they're addressing, as they're addressing their meal. Yeah, Again, beautiful. light is, is really important. But the other action that's going on and where that action is placed, a little more, if the camera angle was a little more to the, to the right, if the person taking the photo was a little more to the right, then that person in the background's elbow would be in the ear of the subject. Those are the things that you don't want to have happen, but they don't happen when you see, when you pay attention, when you're feeling just where you are and what it is that's, that's inspiring, you, inspiring you. The other issue is by tapping the different areas of the image to find the correct exposure, if you look off to the right, you see the window, but it's not blown out. Right. So there's more information there that you can actually see a little bit different exposure and that becomes a big white blob that all of a sudden throws the viewer off and takes right. them in a, in a different and, direction. And everything in the foreground would have gotten darker. Exactly. I have, I've taken a lot of pictures like that. Yeah. <laughs> so tapping that screen, going back, I mean bringing it sort of full circle, tapping that screen is going to be a very important thing, determining where your, your exposure is. Now, one of the problems though with the exposure, and, and there are apps that have solved that, is that depending on where you are, you also have to pay attention to how setting the exposure affects the depth of field. Because if you reach too far back to, to set the exposure, you might rack the person in the foreground out of focus. Mm. So what you want to pay attention to is what is the area that you can choose for your exposure that's closest to the subject oh. that works for you. Oh. But there are apps out there now that, that do allow you, and I think um, one of them, I think I have a, a name for one of them. Is uh, it's called Camera Plus, and it, it was on the 2014 list of best photo apps for iPhones for mobile devices. And what Camera Plus does is allow you to set the focus and the exposure separately. Just like a big camera. There you go. There Impressive. you go. You know, and that's important to remember. Though you can do it, but you just have to see that there are areas of shadow and light all within the focal range that you need to have covered to make mm -hmm. it sharp. Mm -hmm. And so you check those areas and that's how you set your exposure and then you take your picture. But you can also get these apps that will help you make, make sure that your exposure and your uh, focus are set 
separately. That's really helpful. If we could go back for a minute to the previous picture, the woman in the restaurant, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. You mentioned that if the photographer had been in a slightly different position, the woman's elbow might have been in the, in the ear of the person in the foreground. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to imagine as a reporter, where am I? I it's, I'm sitting at the table with this woman. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that it's very difficult to get an image like this when you're taking a picture of someone. She doesn't appear to be self-conscious. She's relaxed. These other people don't appear to know that their photo is being taken. This, it seems to me, is a, a skill that reporters really need to practice. Th this, along with developing an eye that's going to tell you elbow in the ear. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think you're right. Um, of course, with years and years and years of experience, you get better and better at it. But there are some little tricks, too. When I mentioned getting lenses for your iPhone, there are zoom lenses. There are lenses that actually bring things closer so you can actually be farther away. Mm -hmm. You don't want to use the camera zoom because the camera zoom doesn't work that well. It doesn't maintain focus that sharply. Um, you know, things, things in the background get camera shake becomes an issue. Things in the background mm -hmm. sort of uh, go haywire. But there are lenses and other accessories that you can buy that can help you be a little farther away and take it. Then the other thing is, and it's something that people are scared of, and that is being right there and just taking the picture. Right. Most of the time when you're right there and you take the picture, there's really not a problem getting the image. The fear is mostly in the mind of the person taking the picture. I've heard you talk before about something that I think is important to mention here because you just said the the zoom feature on most iPhones, and everybody's familiar with that, where you're putting your fingers on and sort of stretching the screen out mm -hmm. to get closer to your subject. You've talked about, instead of that, using the foot zoom. Yeah, walking, walking up to the subject. <laughs> That's what I call the foot zoom. I'm glad you remembered that. Um, it, it's very important for you to get into the, the image. You have to move forward to get to the area that's important in your image. Um, if you use the zoom to do that, again, you can cause some other issues. If you use longer lenses to do that, that can help you cut your depth of field some. But if you need the depth of field, like in the case of the picture that we were just looking at, right. because there are other things going on that you need to make sure in the image to complete the story that that image is telling, you have to be brave enough to foot zoom. Just walk in there, take the picture, and... and, and right. And, and that's, a, that's a great tip for journalists. Yeah. Do we have more pictures? Uh, sure. Um, this is about motion, too. And, and this is about how you can use uh, the camera to really show how the motion is taking place. When I mentioned follow motion the other uh, in a few images ago, right. um, that's what's going on here. In order to keep the, the subject fairly sharp in the center of the image, you have to keep that subject in the center of the image. And as they're moving, you move the phone. And what the phone does, what happens there is, you see how the background gives you that sense that it's moving, that it's turning? Yes. That's because we're following the motion. And that's, uh, I think that's very, very important. Is there any significance to the fact that this is a black and white photo? You know, the choice of black and white or color has a lot to do with how you feel and what mood you want to put the reader mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. So you can make that decision afterwards, fortunately. Now right. with things like Photoshop and whatever, you can, right. you can change an image from color to black and white. What I find is the most dangerous thing is when people use color as a substitute for good imagery. Mm. They think just because it's red, and I remember as a photographer when, when we first, when newspapers first started uh, moving to color, we used to shoot black and white all the time. And the thing about black and white is you had to pay very close attention to the elements and how you use those elements in an image. Um, and as a matter of fact, back in, in photo school, in J school, we were always taught to even squint to be able to tell what the inherent contrast is. And what happened with the advent of color is that everybody just started screaming, if it's red, take the picture. If it's red, take the picture. <laughs> and so people started losing the idea that even if it's red, it still has to be put in its place in a composition. So color doesn't excuse composi composition. Um, so now black and white becomes a choice that's based on what you want to project. 
Um, often, if people want to create a nostalgic mood, they'll switch to black and white. If they want to, uh, you know, create a sad mood, they'll switch to black and white. But they also, if they want, if they want people to really, really focus on a particular emotion, you can use black and white um, to do that too, uh, or just place the color in the right place. Right. Good to know. What's next? <clears throat> Let's go on. This is again about mood um, and about texture, but now this is texture of a different sort. Because what you've got is a backlit subject, which is fine if you want, on purpose, to emphasize different things. And this, in this case, we're talking about the fog. We're talking about the, the, the texture of the, of the smoky sort of environment that this person is in and how that wraps around the human body. And we're given you know, this sense of eeriness in this particular image. And a human in an eerie environment is pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. <laughs> Very <laughs> mysterious. Yeah. yeah. And see, again, too, what we've got on this is that person is, while it seems vertically they're in the center, look at the offset of the hips and the shoulders and how it starts to move into another section of the photo. Look at the darkness on the right-hand side and how it gradually starts to become light toward the left so that you're actually being moved just like the, 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 uh, the cloud, yeah, the smoke Fog. is surrounding the body. You're actually moving in that direction. There are very slight things in the photo that help too, that help us move toward the back, is that from the bottom right, you even see what look like tire tracks that start to carry you back that way. A lot of people aren't paying attention when they see that. Viewers aren't paying but if the photographer is paying attention, those elements become important parts of the image that help us feel what the photographer wants us to feel. That light going into the back and going into the blackness again gives us that sense of the unknown. You know, these are all things you feel when you walk into this situation. And you, you go, ooh, but what are you going ooh about? Right. Put that in the, in the image. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you think, looking at this image, that these were the, the actual colors, or do you think some kind of filter was applied later? Well, I got to tell you, I don't believe there's a photographer who cares about his work that doesn't get involved in post-production. Mm -hmm. Because, and I've said this a thousand times, you have to beat your equipment into submission. The equipment by itself is, is a very bland, sort of neutral thing. Mm -hmm. That's why you have to pay so much attention to exposure. Right. Because if you leave it up to the camera, the camera is calibrated for, I think it's 18% gray. I think that's still the case, which is a general exposure. It takes into account all the light, all the stuff that's in there, and it just creates this average um, for everybody. So if you just put your camera up there and take a picture and you expect that it's going to show up the way you felt it, you'd be wrong and you'll be disappointed, which is the reason why people have so many images that they're disappointed with. But when you start paying attention, then that process goes from how you create your exposure to how you then go into post-production to just fine tune it, not to tell a lie. And if you do want to tell a lie, if you do want to create an alternate reality, so let me back up, not tell a lie, but if you want to create an alternate reality, as a journalist, your only job is to let people know that that's what you did. Well, I'm glad you said that. This is obviously an area of potential controversy among sure. journalists. We, we don't want to be telling lies, right. but if we are creating something that's that wasn't really there, we need to make sure that we're transparent about that exactly. with our audience. Exactly. And the same is true with ethics and photojournalism. You know, it, there's a point uh, to which you can take an image and you can fine tune it and complete its ability to communicate the reality to people. But then when you pass that point, you just need to let people know, I've created an alternate reality so that you can experience what I'm talking about. That's very important. Right. So what's next? Well, let's take a look. Oh. Macro lenses, zooms, you know. Again, exposure. Very, very important here. But you can do a lot of really, really fun things. That, and, and you that shouldn't... is kind of fun <laughs> yeah. if you like flies. Well, well yeah, <laughs> if you like flies. <laughs> yeah. But again, you know, you've got the foreground where it's supposed to be, the brightest part popping out at you. That's why you notice this the small fly on it. You've got depth of field that's created because you focused on that small area. So that pushes the hands back where they're supposed to be. It's clear that the subject's not, in, not the focus of the photo, 
but it gives you a good sense of perspective and lets you know how you got to see this fly like this. Right. You know. it, it's also just, despite the fly in the foreground, a pretty picture. Mm -hmm. The pink nails, the pink the, whatever that is, the, the blue, the green in the far back, it's, it's very The spooky. pattern of pink, it, it, it really helps to um, increase interest. The, um, the shapes, you see the head of the person on the right is, is really relegated to a shape. Yep. There's a little bit of abstraction there. Yep. Okay. The same thing with the colors and the patterns in the back, but they help you move through the image. And actually those pink fingernails are even pointing to the, the yes. rock and the fly yes. that again keep you focused on what the most important area is yes. and relegates the color, which I talked about before, to a supporting role. Which is where it should be. Right. Yeah, fabulous. Is that the end of our photo show, or do we have uh, one? Well, we've got a bunch of them. Angle. Angle is important. It's another thing that we really want to talk about. Mm -hmm. The angle at which we take a picture also increases the viewer's involvement in the image. It, it increases interest. You know, when you look at this, this is a photo of shad fishing. These are. This, it could be you could have gotten on the side and just taken a picture of you know, four guys in a boat. But here you get a sense of what the whole experience is like for them. You know, you get the rods going off, you've got, you know, one person near the engine, the other three sitting there patiently, so rods are in the water, the shape of the boat becomes very interesting. And again, the exposure makes everything stand out, everything is in its place. Yes, I love the white outline of the, the boat mm -hmm. uh, against the blue water. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Makes me want to be there. Right. Well, the, the thing, too, is that it, it takes us to kind of like the, the final piece of the, the puzzle is while you've got composition and you've got exposure, the, the, the next idea is the idea of storytelling and the experience that you want people to have. And you kind of have to, to think about that when you walk into any situation. When you're a reporter, if you're doing a press conference, you still need to think about storytelling, even in the press conference. People, press conferences are boring, and we talked about that a little I'm, earlier. I'm, I'm glad but, you brought that up, because I did want to talk about press conferences. But, but they do Many have reporters a story. in Washington have to do this, sometimes multiple times a day. But they do have a story to tell. Hmm. And this is the interesting thing. Who's involved in the press conference? And you hear, I hear reports, I see it on TV all the time, and they say, you know, the firebrand Senator so-and-so, you know, held a press, press conference today. Well, if you know that about the person, then your focus should be on that person's expressions, how they express themselves. Who is this person that we're showing to the public and what is it about that person that we want them to know? But if I'm a reporter mm -hmm. in the back of the pack looking at that little firebrand in the front of the room, it's very hard. You can't even, I can't even see his expression. That's right. It doesn't come off as a firebrand if you're in the back of the pack. And, it, and, and so that makes it key. Photographers with SLRs do this all the time. It's more important if, if you're going to do it with, a, with an iPhone is that you have to move up to the point where you can engage the subject in a way that allows you to communicate who that subject is to the people who are going to be reading your story. So you have to get close to the front. You also have to pay attention again to where the light is. If the l subject is being lit from, from your left, which would be their right, you don't want to be on their left-hand side because you're in the shadow area and you can't take advantage of the light. And that's going to be really, really important. So you want to get to a place, to an angle, close to the subject where the light is hitting them in a way that you can use it to tell the story. And the other thing, is, as everybody probably noticed during this webinar, I'm a person who talks with their hands. Well, if this is a person who talks with their hands, that's going to give you a much more interesting photograph than a person who's just standing there with a dead pan look right. on their face. And that's the point of taking the photo. You want the photo to accompany your story. So whatever it is you're talking about in your story, the photo has to contribute to that experience. If this was a press conference where there were a lot of people angry and all you bring back from that press conference is a headshot, then nobody knows. And you're telling them in the story, there were 500 people there and they were angry. How do I know that that's true? I remember having one of my first photo editors say to me, all I know is what I see in the paper. And so that's really, really important to remember. If you want to be able to give people the full experience, 
then not only do you have to walk up to the subject and make sure you're capturing that, but also take the opportunity to turn the camera, your iPhone on the audience and give us a sense of who else is there, what signs are they holding, are they holding, if they're yelling, their mouth should be open too. Right. You know, because you don't want to tell people, and they were yelling at them and everybody's right. like this. So, you know, those are the things that I think are, are, are right. important. And, I, and I'll just make the point in defense of all the journalists out there that while they're covering this press conference, they're trying to take notes, they're trying to think what's the most important <laughs> thing. Maybe they're trying to send a tweet during the conference or two. And in the meantime, they've got their iPhone up just waiting for the right expression, the right hand motion, and they're going to get the crowd. These are all important things, but I, I do sympathize with the reporters out there because you have a very, very tough job. You're absolutely right. Now, all of a sudden, instead of just focusing on, on the one thing, you've right. got a lot of things to, to focus on. Right. So timing is everything. And I think it's important that you recognize the beginning, the middle, and the end of the event hmm. as opportunities for you to take photos or to do the job. If uh, you get prepared remarks from the subject, then you pretty much know what they're going to say. So in the beginning, in the beginning, what you might be able to do is spend some time as this person is giving their opening remarks, taking the pictures, and then call it a day and do the rest, you know, of the story. Or maybe toward the end, if they're answering questions right. um, and the crowd is getting rowdy, you can take some pictures then. But you can plan that. You have to, you have to talk in advance to people and say, well, what's this going to be like? What's the timing? So that you can make some decisions about how you'll handle your very, very difficult job. Right. Yeah, good, good points about maybe taking some pictures at the end because it's during that Q&A portion that you're likely to get more interesting expressions from mm -hmm. the speaker, especially if they're faced with something they didn't expect. Sure, so. exactly, exactly. Yeah, so. good. Can we um, pivot a little bit to something more technical? Sure. Is it possible to take a picture with an iPhone that you can later print in a larger size that won't just become grainy when it gets bigger than five by seven? And, sure. And if so, how do you do that? What do you look at while you're taking it? And what are there things you can do afterward? Well, I, I think, again, the things that really affect uh, how large a picture can get mm -hmm. are resolution, and sharpness. Right. You know. So making sure that your image is sharp is, is first mm -hmm. and foremost. That's, mm -hmm. that's a very important thing. Secondly, the iPhone gives you a number of options for the size of the image, from the smallest at you know, 300 kilobytes or something like that to the largest at 2 megabytes or whatever whatever size that is. So are, are you talking about when I, after I've taken a picture, when I'm trying to send it to somebody, right. either in a text or in exactly. a message, exactly. phone says what size, exactly. I never know what size to pick. Just always pick the largest size. Oh. You just want to work with the largest possible size, especially now when you can email things that are up to 25 megs. I mean, I'm just saying just generally. Right. Most people's mailbox will take, well, at least uh, an attachment that's 10 15 megs. Well, that's, that's way larger than anything you will need. You know, a 5 meg photo, you can, you can print 11 by 14, mm -hmm. 16 by 20 if you want, depending on, you know, because they're all, they're all, you know, compressed to some degree. But there are applications that are also available to help you increase the resolution of an image. And one of them, uh, we call it genuine fractals, which actually, you know, rearranges the pixels so that the image can be blown up much larger. Okay. In, 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 at Seabury Design, we use that um, sometimes to create ads that will be placed on the back of buses or on this, right. along the sides of buses where an image needs to be absolutely huger than anybody would normally, you know. Right. Do. So there are apps out there that'll help you with that. But in, but in general, just, for printing in a newspaper purposes, mm -hmm. just always send the largest file that the iPhone allows you to send. All right, very good to know. Okay. And there are also applications out there um, for file transfer protocol, FTP. Right. Where you can FTP uh, an image from your iPhone directly to the server at your, at your newspaper, and then your photo editor will take care of it. If you're lucky enough to have a photo editor, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, even if, that's a great option. And even if you're going to do some post um, processing you know, on your phone, you can do that. Photoshop Touch is, is, is one 
program, and, and there are others, there are many others. Mm -hmm. um, choose which one you like and which one you're most familiar with mm -hmm. that allow you to do some toning on the phone itself and send that image. Oh, that's, that's also good to know. Mm -hmm. Any other advice, tips, anything we haven't covered that you think journalists should know when they're shooting on an iPhone? Well, uh, I think it, it just bears, I think it's important to just sort of repeat some of the things we're talking about. Um, one of them, and, and I think a, a, a big rule of thumb for me, and I'll, I'll say it again, is, is walk into the light. Just really recognize that it is the light that's important. Mm -hmm. And if the light isn't where you need it to be to tell the story that you need to tell, then you're not going to be telling that story. And, and there's just no two ways about it. If, if you're taking a portrait and the shadow is on the person's face and the wall behind him is lit, then it's, then it's not a successful portrait. Making sure you choose what area of the frame that you need to expose for is really, really important too. Because what light does is it affects, affects what we call tonal range. And you want to have a range everywhere from the darkest dark, the blackest black in your mm -hmm. image, to the, to the whitest white in very small areas. When you choose the correct exposure, you will see how the tonal range increases the saturation and the beauty and, of course, the intensity, the meaning that's, that's, that's in the image. Be conscious of the entire frame from corner to corner, from top to bottom. This way, you won't miss that arm or that butt or that head that's somehow sticking in there. Um, and you won't miss the photo bombers when they, when they jump in there. Right. So you have to be conscious of that. Because when you're conscious of the entire frame, then you go to that next step, and that's going to be com composition. Right. In the frame should be all of the elements that you need to tell the story, no more and no less. You don't need every single person in a 500-person crowd to let everybody know that it's crowded. Right. What you do need is a pack of people who are pressed together. Right. And that will tell everybody, wow, this place is crowded. You don't need every single sign of protest. But in that packed crowd, that one sign can make a difference, which brings us to angle and choice of position. So you choose what angle is the best angle for you to tell a story from. Mm -hmm. If you're shooting a headshot of a person in a, in a um, press conference, then you want to be where the light is. But if you're shooting a crowd, you want to be kind of above them so that you can get you know, the sense of the intensity on their faces and get as many numbers as, as is reasonable, as will tell the story in it. Uh, just like with that fishing um, picture, the Chad fishing picture, angle also can make things very interesting. Yes. You know, you get we're, the we're environment, you get, right, you get inside of the, of, of the boat instead of just from the side. So we get more information, we get more people. I also wanted to note about this picture, mm -hmm. something you mentioned earlier about the tonal range. Mm -hmm. One of the things that impressed me about that white outline of the, the boat is the way it c contrasts with the darkness of the ocean. When you look at that picture, you can really see the darkest, the lightest, and, mm -hmm. and everything in between. Right, in and the, the very water. low Just left beautiful. hand corner of that image, there's an area, a small area of really, Real really black. black. Mm -hmm. at the, just to the right of the person at the rear of the boat, at the stern of the boat's head, is a little glint of light off of one of the, of the uh, fishing rods. And that's a white, white area. Mm -hmm. And then it's supported by almost every shade in between. That yep. creates the separation. Yep. It's just a matter of picking the right exposure. And, you know, again, when you do your post-processing, you're just putting everything in place. You're not, you're not trying to change, you know, that, right. that image. So, so those are the things that are really, really important. And then thinking of shape and positive and negative space, which also have to do with exposure. Think of texture, you know, and how that influences people's emotions, how it helps them follow a line back very rapidly or, or stay put in a very peaceful um, sort of way. Look at pattern and how patterns lead you to the central uh, point of your image, how they can take you from left to right or from top to bottom, they also increase the interest. And then the rule of thirds is looking at what's happening in all three sections of your image. Uh, portraits, for example, should be offset a little bit to the right or the left instead of dead on in the center right. where they become very static and very boring. Because right. what happens in the center of an image, 
what happens with people's eyes is when they look at something and it's in the center, they immediately just create this shape for it and then they leave it. There's no more studying of the image because there's nothing else to look at. You've given too much balance between central and right and left with nothing of interest and people just sort of glaze over when they, when they look at it. So those are things that are, that are really, really important. But it's also important to recognize it's exactly what you do from day to day with your own eyes as you experience the world. The stuff that's boring, you don't pay attention to. Right. The stuff that, that is interesting is usually offset and you say, I saw that out of the corner of my eye. Or I saw that you know, this way. And isn't that interesting because it's bent over. Those are the things that give us the visual cues that keep us interested in a story or even just walking down the street. Fantastic. This has been so useful. I'm so grateful. Thank you very, very much, Torin Beasley, Vice President, Seabury Design and Communications. Please check the schedule of upcoming webinars at nationalpress.org. Sign up for the newsletter. And thank you for joining us in the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation, where we are making good journalists better. <laughs>